Yes, one more mini PC review. Now, I reviewed an AMD one in the channel that was just fantastic value for money, selling for about 280 US dollars with RAM, with a NVMe SSD, and very good thermals and fan noise, but it was only the Ryzen, it is only the Ryzen 5, the 2500U. But I've got something that really steps up the performance here. This is, of course, the Ryzen 5 3400G. Vega 11 graphics, so much more powerful, but it still is in a very small case considering how much is in here in terms of power, 65 watt CPU. Now the base clock on this one is 3.7 gigahertz on the all four cores of it. It's a quad core with eight threads, and it does have the Vega 11 graphics, which does clock up to 1400 megahertz. Now the CPU itself is unlocked, meaning we could actually overclock it, but you can't with the motherboard that is in this one. So I'll find out in this in-depth video, is it gonna be able to handle this tiny little case, this small cooler, all that power, or is it end up just gonna be cooking itself and not a great mini PC? Let's find out. Inside the box, you'll find our power cable, HDMI cable, we've got the two wireless antennas, and this is a stand here if you wanted to stand it up vertically and not have it sitting flat horizontally. Now the power supply that is included, it is a known brand, this one here, rated to a maximum output of 120 watts. So the front of this mini PC, we've got the separate line in and out there. We do have four USB 2s at the front. So I would have liked to have seen maybe two USB 3s and two USB 2s. Power on button here with a blue status LED within it. And this is a vent on the front. So cool air is actually sucked through this front panel here as well. Uh, no dust filters or anything, as you can see. Now on the underside, we've got these four rubber feet, so you can either prop it down, have it just sitting on a table, or as I showed you with the stand there, you can just have it standing up there. So the top and bottom, if you're standing it up, nothing, it's just metal. So the whole chassis out of this is made out of this solid metal, and it does have a good feel to it, not too bad. And then let's have a look at the ports we've got on the back here. So port selection, uh, isn't too bad here, but I would have liked to have seen a second port here for display out 4K60. They should have put a display port, I believe, here, maybe instead of the VGA. So VGA, HDMI 2, power in, of course, SMA connectors there for our wireless card, two USB 3s here, and another two on the other side, and we've got our gigabit LAN. There's also a lock slot here. So most of the hot air will be pushed out of this vent right here at the back, which uh, you can see aligns not quite perfectly there with that cooler which is inside. And lastly we have the lid or the left hand side depending on how you're looking at this mini PC. So this is the intake for the fan or it does actually draw air in through the front of it as well that is open. So this you've got two screws on the back here so very much like a desktop PC. I mean after all this does have a desktop PC processor. So you just slide it off, lift it up, and that reveals our internals here. So I did buy the base spec, the eight gigabytes of RAM and 128 gigabytes of storage because I wanted to upgrade this and I'm gonna use my own SSD, my own RAM, which I will do shortly. So to replace the RAM, which is upgradable right here, uh, you're gonna have to remove this. So this is our heatsink and the blower all in one. So it looks like one of those older MSI or ASUS gaming laptop coolers. You know, those real thick, thick, chunky desktop laptop replacements. Uh, they're the ones, the desktop replacement ones that have these coolers. So we've got a wireless card right here that is replaceable. Now that's the Intel 3165. That is a wireless AC with Bluetooth 4.2, I believe it is. And yes, we can install a 2.5 inch SATA drive right here as a space for that. Below it is a SATA 3 drive that it comes with. So this is only 128 gigabytes. I mean, that's not a, enough space for anyone in 2020. So I will be using my own one. So it supports MVME. A little difficult to get the, to those components, but it is possible. There's actually a BIOS battery right under here, a little hard to see, it's right there. And that if you do end up messing up any of the BIOS settings, you can simply unclip that, um, plug the power and you reset the BIOS. But let's get this off and I'll install my RAM and my NVMe SSD. All right, so just undoing the last screw here. So these are those spring ones that apply like a constant pressure down on top of that heat sink there with the fan. So let's have a look at the thermal paste job out of the factory. They probably use that horrible paste that dries up. Just lift this out and let's take a look. So there's the heat sink on the back and the paste is a, a gold color paste, okay? I haven't seen that before. And we've got the two copper transfer thermal pipes there. A lot of copper here, this is a thick, 
copper base. So it doesn't look too bad. And, and we'll look at thermals later on in this video and focus on that. So there is our AM4 socket. So in theory, this is upgradable. You can use other chips in here, but the 4000 series will not be supported, I believe, at the time of this video by AMD on the A320 chipset that this one has. So it's very low end chipset, so it's not actually supported overclocking or upgrades. So I'm gonna pull that four gigabyte stick out, DDR4 spec here, very easy to do so. And what I'm gonna use is this. So this is a crucial here. I've got DDR4 3200. Hopefully I'll be able to run it at that speed. I think it's CL20, the timing. So pretty good trying to just maximize on that performance. And of course a lot of RAM there. So very easy to install this. And um, you probably upgraded laptops, maybe some of you in the channel. So it's the exact same thing, of course, using the Sonjin slots. So that is done. And I'll now tackle this SSD here. We have, so this one is SATA, it's King Spec. The RAM as well was King Spring, King Spec, sorry, the brand. So this is the old SSD. Now I did benchmark this one. It's about 500 reads megabytes per second and 450, not super quick. And so I'm just gonna put an MV1 in here, MVME. This is from Sabrent, two terabytes, quite quick. And let's get that screw in place. So this is not hard to do to install the components. And if you wanted to upgrade that wireless card, again, that's easy to do. So I'm gonna just quickly clean this up. This funny gold paste they have used out of the factory and repaste that and get this put back on and reassembled. And we'll jump into the BIOS, take a look at that. And then Windows and our performance figures from this. So we do have a lot of options in this particular BIOS and I recommend you don't mess around with anything in there too much. If you're unfamiliar, you don't know really what you're doing. The good thing is you can remove the BIOS battery to just reset anything if you run into problems. So you've got pretty much every single setting you can think of apart from overclocking. Overclocking is not supported by this chipset, which is a shame because it's an overclockable CPU that we have installed, this APU I should say. So under CPU configuration, you've got some options here. There are a few tweaking options, but I'm gonna jump into uh, probably the most important ones here. And this is, well, the super IO configuration. You can then set to have it boot up automatically if it loses power. A lot of people do want that feature and it's good to see it is here on board with this particular mini PC. Hardware monitor, this one, if you wanna adjust the way the fan is. Now I've tweaked this a little tiny bit out of the box, how they have it. It's kind of a little, I think a little bit too loud when it's at low temperatures. So you can just start with a base of say a hundred to start with and 120 will be a little bit louder and you just uh, tweak that, fine tune that. It's a little annoying, but you can get a good balance between it being quiet and not getting too hot as you'll see later on. So what else do we have in here? Well, lots and lots of different things. The important ones really under this one, AMD CBS. So CPU options, but I'm gonna show you how to set higher RAM speeds and even do a bit of overclocking with the RAM, which is uh, under this one here, UMC common option. So we want a DDR4, common options, timing configuration, and you have to accept this little warning here. And overclock, yeah, I wanna do that. So enable it. And all I'm gonna do is just change this right here. So the memory clock speed. I'll leave the rest as auto, and that'll pull through from from what it actually has under the speed preferences of the RAM anyway. So this particular RAM uh, can go quite high. So I'm gonna set it to its maximum and hopefully this is gonna work, 1600 megahertz, but you of course times this uh, by two. So that is set, that's how you overclock and set the RAM. You can tweak lots and lots of things in there. Another interesting one could be under this particular menu here is there are some not exactly overclocking options, well, for the GPU, okay? So you can set a higher clock and higher clock voltage for the Vega 11 graphics that this one has. But I'm not gonna go into all of this into too much detail. Um, there's a few other things, the GPU enhancement memory mode, you can tweak. First up, we'll take a brief look at the APU here from AMD. So this is the Ryzen 5, it's the 3400G, as I pointed out at the start of the video. Now it can hold this one 3.9 gigahertz across all for those cores, but it's sadly not overclockable. I mean, the chip is, but the motherboard does not permit us to do any overclocking, only the RAM as I showed you with the bias, so we cannot adjust the voltages. Now, if you've got a keen eye, you would have probably noticed that what is going on here with that core voltage? Now, it cannot surely be running at two volts on this chip. That would probably damage it, fry it, and I'd have insane thermals and the power supply probably couldn't handle it either. So I, I believe that's just incorrectly reported, it has to be. 
And we cannot adjust the voltage anyway because, again, it's it's not unlocked. The BIOS doesn't permit us to adjust voltages or things like that. No overclocking there. So it is, you can see, the A320, the chipset. And I am on, at the time of this video, the, the BIOS that, well, it comes with the latest that you can get. Now, memory speeds, it is running at the 3.2 gigahertz here that I've managed to run. Now, these timings aren't brilliant. You've got to remember that this is laptop RAM, so DDR4 SODIMS, not your desktop variant, which would have a lot better timings there. And only that have heat spreaders and things on them too as well. Well, this doesn't basically have any heat spreaders. And the RAM's located under where the heatsink is. So graphics, the Vega 11 graphics does have two gigabytes allocated to it. We cannot adjust this. It's the highest settings, and it can help with the, the frame rates just to keep it a little bit more stable. There have been some tests done, and people have noticed that if it's half a gigabyte or it's two gigabytes, the two gigabyte one will give us actually better 1% frames, so you don't see those big horrible frame dips as much when you've got the two uh, gigabytes there dedicated. So on to just a few benchmarks I have run, of course. So Geekbench 4. Uh, the single core score actually came out a lot better than I expected. Our maximum turbo is 4.2 gigahertz on this one. Multi-core score here for a quad core is okay, but it is it is nothing amazing. Now, it could be better, again, if we could actually overclock the chip with this motherboard with this chipset, but we cannot do that. Geekbench 5, it's a decent score. It's not bad. I don't think it's bad at all for this style and the size, of course, of this mini PC. This is Geekbench 5's OpenCL score. This is a good score, this one. Very good. Because the Vega 11 does have the 11 cores and much better than Intel's integrated graphics. As you'll see here, so looking at Firestrike, this is, you know, that's not an amazing score, but look at our graphics score here. 4,000, over 4,000. How does that compare to the last mini PC I reviewed? So the last one I reviewed had the Ryzen 5 3550H and it got a score just over 3,000 points. So this is a good 1,000 points higher, and you'll see later on when I test games, it really does perform quite well. So this is bettering, for example, a low dedicated NVIDIA card like, say, the 1030 or the MX250, the 25-watt version of Cena laptops. This is actually faster. This is a good maybe 700, 600 points faster there. And I did also run Night Raid 2. With a decent graphics score, again, we're seeing promising results here from the Avega 11. Very good integrated graphics. PC Mark 10. Now, do bear in mind that I didn't end up using the 128 gigabyte SATA 3 SSD that's included with this package. They really should sell a bare bones because I couldn't fit all my files onto it. So that's why I just installed an NVMe SSD. So that means these product productivity scores will be a little bit higher because of the SSD. Okay, that's going to be aiding but it's still a great score here. I think that's very good, acceptable. So Cinebench R15, almost 700 CB. Remember my RAM is helping out a little bit with those timings. If you're running the stock eight gigabytes, if you happen to buy one of these, then expect a score of about 640, 650 CB that I was getting there. So the RAM is only giving just a slight boost here with these synthetic benchmarks. You, it does really aid, though, the integrated graphics, as you'll see when, when I start the game just after this. So CPU score here for our Cinebench R20. It's decent. It's not bad. But, it, it you know, it's nothing amazing. Uh, again, it could be better if we could actually overclock. But, you know, we can't. So video playback. If you're using this for media files and you've got some really demanding 4K clips, very, very good. Okay, anything you throw at the Vega 11 is just going to handle with absolute ease. It doesn't really get stressed out at all. So 140 megabit per second, 4K 10 bit, HEVC, flawless playback, very good. No starters, skip ahead on the timeline there, it takes a few seconds, and again, it's just perfect. No problems there. Sony Swordsmith, 60 frames per second, 4K. Perfect. We're not seeing any like, lag at the start. That's running at 60 frames per second, not at 40, not at 30, 60. And skipping ahead. Again, that is absolute flawless playback. Any video file, VP9, HEVC, 10-bit, 4K, handles it with ease. And, and that is good. So it smooths, and editing the video is fine, as long as it's not a super complex, multi-layered, you know, you've got lots of animations, transitions, and all sorts of things going on. My edits here are very basic, and it is quick for that. But just how quick on the export time. So what I'm going to do now is get this set up for exporting here. 
So just go down to export the setting here. So it'll be the YouTube preset that I always test one minute of footage. And it should take about 44 seconds like the last one I looked at with the Ryzen 3550H. So there we go. That's close to one minute of footage, as close as I can get it there. And I'm going to hit start here on the timer and export as soon as I could, which is about a second later. And it just powers through this. So have a look. You can see that the Vega 11 graphics is at 100%. So it is doing most of the work there. And that is steaming along very, very fast. But will it beat the Intels? Sadly, it won't. Adobe, their suite of products definitely favors still Intel. Okay, you get much better performance on Intel. In my experience, about 25% still faster encoding times. Uh, recently with the Core i7, the 9750H, I managed to do this test in just 22 seconds, very quick. So this is looking great. So that was about 43 seconds for one minute of footage there. 4K, the YouTube preset, which is excellent for a small mini PC here. The Witcher 3 at 1080p on the lowest preset is just too much. So I'm gonna lower the resolution down to 1080, sorry, to 720p from 1080p. And that should give us then a steady, well, more playable frame rate at least. So this is much better now. We're getting about 50 frames per second on average, which is a lot better than the 24, 25, 27 we were getting. So it has almost doubled it. It is still a very demanding game though, The Witcher 3 even though it's, what, five years old. So really, the more demanding games you will have to run and play in 720p with this. 1080p is just too choppy with this one. But what about an even older title? Let's have a look now quickly at Counter-Strike Global Offensive. So with Counter-Strike here, I cannot show you my FPS counter anymore because Valve is cracking down on cheaters. They don't want any third-party applications running with their games, so that's why I've done that. Otherwise, you get flagged as not being safe or passing their test there. Frame rate, however, 1080p is very good. I am seeing a nice smooth frame rate and that is really to be expected with such a low engine title like this. Light engine title, should I say, with our graphics. And yes, of course, I died straight away. Did I even hit him? I don't think I did. No, it didn't hit anyone. So the main thing is, these older games, very, very playable with the Vega 11 graphics. And to very quickly show you that yes, Linux is working and running just fine on this particular mini PC. No problems, it is very, very quick. And because we don't have a touch screen or anything, we don't have to hunt around for drivers because we've had the Intel wireless AC3165 drivers for a very long time and that is not a problem. So if you plan to run it on this, it will run really well with this hardware, of course. Okay, so let's get onto the big con of this particular mini PC, yes. Such a small case, so much power, it is getting very, very hot. Now, the thermals on the CPU itself are actually very good. It will not go over 90 degrees. Very loud fan. You can probably hear it in the background right now. It's screaming away. But look at these temperatures internally. The chipset gets up to 75 degrees, 76, 78, and almost 80 degrees. This is far too hot for my liking here. I know it's got a heat sink on it, but this is just way too hot for these components and... Longevity, I doubt this one will last a long time running always at these temperatures if you push it really hard. Now it will pull 150 watts also from the wall, which is quite a lot. That's the peak 150 watt I'm seeing. And idle is quite high too. It's about 30 to 28, 25 watts. I do believe they just got this bias configured wrong. It's not configured correctly, I believe. So when you've got it face down, it, it heats up my table like nothing else. And when I go to touch it, and I got the probe out as well, it was, what was it? It was 55 degrees. And when it gets over 50, I'm not happy. I think that's too hot. It's a metal case, but that motherboard is really heating up. Those components there, the chipset is heating up. My SSD temperatures were okay. They're only about 60 degrees. Maximum temperatures from that little cooler in there aren't too bad. So it will get up to 90 degrees maximum, considering how small and compact this is and gaming very hard. I think that is okay. Now I did mention that the CPU is unlocked, it's overclockable, but the BIOS shouldn't allow us to overclock. In fact, it doesn't. There are no overclocking settings, only RAM, uh, and the chipset, the A320, doesn't support overclocking. However, 
look at those base clocks that I managed to get. So I can stress it out and actually get it to clock up to 3.9 gigahertz across all four cores. The base clock is 3.7, so it is actually overclocked but it's just far too much heat for such a small compact little mini PC. Now the ports on the rear, the display ports out, display out, VGA, I, I think that should have been a display port, okay? With 4K60 from that, if we had display port would have been great. HDMI 2 on there is good to see, but really they should have put the two 4K displays out. I think most people would have won that with that spec. So that is, I feel for the price, it's just simply not worth it. You're better off building yourself one of those ASRock mini, mini PCs. Um, with the motherboard and actual system fan inside to keep things cooler. This one is just too hot, too hot. So take a look at the AMD, uh, the Ryzen 2500U mini PC I reviewed. It doesn't have the levels of power as this one, but for the 280 US dollars that one has been selling for, it actually has very decent performance, can run two 4K 60 hertz monitors, comes with RAM as well, eight gigabytes and a 256 gigabyte NVMe SSD. This one has SATA 3 only, and that's slow. And I only got the 128 gigabyte base mod anyway because I wanted to upgrade it. So sadly, and now and then I do strike a few lemons in the channel, and this is one. And it's been a frustrating mini PC to review. And thank you anyway for watching this video if you were interested in it. And there will be more up and coming mini PC reviews. I hope to get another Ryzen and maybe even the 4800U series that ASUS has one out there. I'm trying to get hold of it. Hopefully we'll have it soon to review in the channel.